Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Iron Deficiency Anemia and Heavy Menstrual Bleeding, Prevalence, Impact, Management. My name is Marissa Clifford, and I am the Director of Education at the Foundation for Women and Girls with Blood Disorders. I will be moderating today's webinar. Next slide. The Foundation for Women and Girls with Blood Disorders mission is to ensure that all women and girls with blood disorders are correctly diagnosed, optimally treated, and managed at every life stage. To this end, we aim to provide education to healthcare providers on the medical consequences and unique issues for women and girls with blood disorders. Next slide. Today's presenters are Dr. Lakshmi Shravas and Dr. Jacqueline Powers, both from Baylor College of Medicine, Department of Pediatrics, Hematology Section. Dr. Shravas also serves as co-director of the Young Women's Bleeding Disorder Clinic. Next slide. The activity medical director for today's webinar is Dr. Andra James from Duke University. The planning committee for today's presentation include today's faculty and Dr. Barbara Conkel from the University of Washington, Dr. Roshni Kulkarni from Michigan State University, and James Munn from the University of Michigan. Next slide. In accordance with Creighton University Health Sciences continuing education policy, the faculty and planning committee for today's webinar have disclosed any significant financial interest or other relationships of interest relative to the topics that will be discussed during this program. Such disclosures allow you to better evaluate the objectivity of the information presented in the lecture. You may learn more about this at the Foundation's website, fwgbd.org. Next slide. To ensure the best sound quality during the webinar, all attendees will be muted. However, you will have the opportunity to participate in a question and answer session with the faculty at the end of the webinar. You can submit your questions during or after the presentation portion of the webinar via the chat box in your GoToWebinar control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. We will address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Next slide. This learning activity is offered through the Creighton University Health Sciences Continuing Education, which has been accredited for offering one AMA PRI PRA Category 1 credit for physicians and one contact hour for nursing professionals. Next slide. To begin, we would like to do a quick poll to see how many people are joining us today with others. Please take a moment to answer the poll question on your screen. We'll keep the poll open for about 20 seconds or so. We're already getting quite a few responses in. Look at that. Okay, we'll leave it open for a few more seconds. We have uh, several teams that are joining as a group as well as a number of individual participants. Well, I think we're, um, we're good. Thank you for your responses and you can please close the poll. Um, so the following are the learning objectives for today's webinar. For those who wish to refer to these later, we are recording the program and it will be archived on our website. I would now like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Lakshmi Shravas. Dr. Shravas? Thank you, Marisa. Good morning to all the webinar attendees, and our sincere thanks to the Foundation for Women and Girls with Blood Disorders for giving us this great opportunity to talk about the prevalence, impact, and management of iron deficiency anemia in heavy menstrual bleeding. So our presentation outline is as follows. We will be talking about the prevalence of iron deficiency anemia and iron deficiency in heavy menstrual bleeding, presenting features and impact of iron deficiency anemia on various factors. This will be my part of the presentation, and then Dr. Jacqueline Powers will discuss the principles of iron deficiency anemia and management. So let's take a look at the prevalence of iron deficiency anemia in heavy menstrual bleeding. As we all know, iron deficiency is the most common nutritional deficiency worldwide. However, it is much more prevalent in developing countries when compared to the US. Yet, there have been several national health and nutrition examination surveys conducted nationally in the United States that have shown significant prevalence in the US, 
among certain vulnerable populations like toddlers and females of childbearing age from 12 to 49 years of age. The NHANE Survey 3 conducted from 1988 to 1994 showed the prevalence of iron deficiency to be highest amongst adolescent girls at 8.7% to 11%. So the national health objectives were established in 2010 to decrease the prevalence of iron deficiency by three to four percentage points, and also to decrease prevalence of iron deficiency in females of childbearing age to 7%. Subsequently, another NHANE survey was conducted from 1999 to 2000, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reported on the comparison of this survey to the NHANES 3 survey, and this report was published in Journal of American Medical Association in 2002, which showed that in the NHANES survey conducted from 1999 to 2000, the estimated prevalence still remained greatest among adolescent and adult females 12 to 49 years of age at 9 to 16%. So the prevalence continued to remain the same in both NHANES 3 and NHANES 1999 to 2000. And they also concluded that iron deficiency remains two to five percentage points above the national health objectives established in 2010. So in this report, they concluded that continued monitoring of iron status in the US population is warranted as prevalence of iron deficiency in the vulnerable populations, including females of the reproductive age group continues to exceed national health objectives established in 2010. There have been several single center publications in the United States that have reported on the prevalence of iron deficiency anemia in association with heavy menstrual bleeding. And I've summarized some of these studies in this table. The first study is our own centers in experience. When we reported on adolescent females with heavy menstrual bleeding, and showed that 50% of 132 females who were enrolled on the Menorrhagia Data Registry Protocol from 2009 to 2011 had anemia. There have been similar such reports looking at iron deficiency anemia in adolescent females with heavy menstrual bleeding from Children's Medical Center in Dallas, Blood Center in Wisconsin. Also, there have been similar publications in adult females with heavy menstrual bleeding reporting on iron deficiency anemia prevalence coming from UCLA Medical Center and Northwestern University showing significant anemia and iron deficiency. Nationally, some of the investigators at the Foundation for Women and Girls with Blood Disorders in collaboration with the researchers at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention looked at the data collected through the female UDC module of the Universal Data Collection Project by the Centers for the Disease Control. And this data was collected from September 2009 to 2011. And we evaluated patients, both adolescents and adult women with bleeding disorders and heavy menstrual bleeding. And we reported on the differences in the bleeding phenotype and provider interventions in both the groups. And in this publication in Hemophilia in 2018, we showed that anemia was prevalent to a large extent in both the patient populations. However, as shown in this table here, we showed that adult women had a greater prevalence when compared to adolescents with an increased adjusted odds ratio of 2.2 and 2.7 by two different models. Perhaps this could be because of the following reasons. We also showed in this publication that adult women, when compared to adolescents, had increased bleeding complications, such as post-procedural bleeding and GI bleeding, and also had a delay in diagnosis, more often seen in adult women when compared to adolescents, and perhaps all these could have contributed to a greater prevalence of anemia in adult women, calling for a very prompt recognition and evaluation of females with heavy menstrual bleeding in general to be able to detect and treat the iron deficiency anemia. It is not just iron deficiency anemia that is present in this patient population. There are several reports that have looked at the prevalence of just iron deficiency without anemia. A cross-sectional study in 44 premenopausal African-American women attending a community fair 
showed a very high prevalence of iron deficiency in 75 to 83 percent of these women with heavy menstrual bleeding, whereas only 25 to 42 percent had anemia. Of 236 women with heavy menstrual bleeding in five university hospitals in Finland, 60 percent were found to have a low ferritin, whereas only 27 percent were anemic. Another study looking at adolescents with heavy menstrual bleeding showed that half of their patient population had a low ferritin, whereas only a quarter were anemic. So based on these reports, we can conclude that if we were to screen females with heavy menstrual bleeding with just hemoglobin or blood count without performing iron studies, iron deficiency can be missed. Let's take a quick look at the presenting features of iron deficiency anemia. We all know that it, uh, pallor can be seen in these patients. Also, pica or altered taste and craving for different substances such as clay, rocks, starch, etc., have been reported. I saw a patient last week who had craving for toilet paper. Intense craving for ice, also called pagophagia, is often reported. Severe iron deficiency can lead to spooning of nails, called coilonychia. Fatigue, irritability, impaired memory, poor concentration, impaired cognitive development, cardiovascular compromise, and rare associations with thrombosis and stroke have all been reported. Before taking a detailed look at these, let us look at the role of the iron at a cellular level. As shown in these diagrams here, heme and iron Iron sulfur clusters are very important for several proteins and enzymes at the cellular level, and especially the enzymes for DNA replication and repair. Also, cell cycle regulators like cytochromes and cytochrome-dependent kinases are iron-dependent, and so the activation of these cell cycle regulators can be affected in the setting of iron deficiency. Iron is very important for energy metabolism, Iron is essential for heme-containing enzymes such as cytochrome and cytochrome oxidase, and also iron-containing non-heme enzymes like NADH dehydrogenase and succinate dehydrogenase in the respiratory chain, and also aconitase in the Krebs cycle. So iron is very important for ATP production and energy metabolism. Studying rodent models with iron deficiency, it has been shown that there have been several changes and abnormalities in their brain development, reductions in markers for energy metabolism that lead to a compromised cellular energy status. It has been shown that iron is essential for the synthesis and maintenance of neurotransmitters, and as a result, deficiency can lead to short and long-term adverse effects of motor activity. Iron is essential for neuronal myelination and can lead to reduced speed of processing. And several structural abnormalities have been shown specifically in the hippocampus area of the brain, which can lead to possible effects on recognition, learning, memory, and orientation in space. More than 300 genes have been shown to be altered in the setting of iron deficiency. And studies have shown that these changes can be irreversible in a very young child. In an older adolescent and adult, this may be reversible, but yet the um, effect can take a long time to be reversed after iron supplementation. So all these changes can lead to multiple defects in brain development, and as a result, iron deficiency can affect cognitive development. A study by Scott and colleagues looking at executive functioning tasks in 127 females aged 18 to 35 years showed better iron status is associated with better attention and planning ability. A study looking at 126 women in tea plantation in India and comparing them to the control population who consumed only iodized salt and feeding the uh, patient population with doubly fortified salt with both potassium iodide and ferrous fumarate, they showed that significant improvement was noted in perception, attention, and mnemonic function, which positively correlated with changes in their blood iron markers. A study looking at 105 women attending university showed that their grade point average was higher in women with normal ferritin compared to those with low ferritin with a very significant p-value. 
another study looking at 157 normal weight women and 142 obese women showed that females with iron deficiency anemia as depicted in this bar diagram with a red bar showed very much decreased attention in females with iron deficiency anemia when compared to the iron replete women in the green bar and females who were just iron deficient without anemia as illustrated in this blue bar. Another study looking at Rwandan females with low ferritin and who were treated with iron fortified beans for 18 weeks showed significant improvement in multiple aspects of spatial attention, capacity, and speed of memory retrieval and search efficiency when compared to the control population when they were challenged with some computerized tasks. Iron deficiency has been shown to affect the school performance. We saw earlier that the NHANES Survey 3 showed that the prevalence of iron deficiency in school-aged females ages 12 to 16 years was at 8.7%, and a publication in Pediatrics in 2001 showed that math scores were affected in the iron deficient group, and this was very much noted in females ages 12 to 16 years. Iron deficiency can negatively impact quality of life. Study from Finland on 236 women with heavy menstrual bleeding, wherein they were grouped based on their pretreatment hemoglobin less than 12 versus more than 12, pretreatment serum ferritin less than 15 versus more than 15, and who were studied with health-related quality of life measure, which was performed at baseline, and at six and 12 months after treatment for their heavy menstrual bleeding with either hysterectomy or levonorgestrel IUD. And the study showed that certain parameters, certain domain scores of the health-related quality of life improved after treatment of heavy menstrual bleeding, namely energy, physical functioning, and social functioning scores increased, whereas anxiety and depression scores decreased. Iron deficiency has been associated with fatigue. A study looking at 48 adolescents and comparing them with the control group showed that patients with iron deficiency and elevated fatigue scores were commonly found in young women with heavy menstrual bleeding. A direct association could not be established in the study, perhaps because of the small sample size. But however, both iron deficiency and elevated fatigue scores were present in females with heavy menstrual bleeding when compared to healthy controls. The Ferrim trial reported from four study centers in Switzerland was a randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled study published in blood in 2011, where 90 premenopausal women with fatigue and low ferritin but normal hemoglobin were studied by giving either IV iron sucrose for four days or randomizing them to receive placebo. And as you can see in this diagram here, in the patients who received the iron supplementation with IV iron sucrose, the fatigue scores from baseline significantly improved six weeks after therapy. Whereas in the placebo group, the fatigue scores were not different from baseline to six weeks after receiving placebo. Iron deficiency has been associated with depression. A web-based survey which looked at a large number of Japanese participants, 50% of whom were women, evaluated them with psychological distress scale and showed that the rate of self-reported lifetime history of iron deficiency anemia was higher in the depression group in women when compared to control. And the reverse was also true. Self-reported history of depression was positively associated with self-reported history of iron deficiency anemia, both with a very significant p-value. That is shown here in this bar diagram. As you can see, iron deficiency anemia was prevalent to a greater extent in the uh, patients who reported depression when compared to the control population overall and in men. But the prevalence was much greater in women and the difference also was very much perceptible. A systematic review and meta-analysis that summarized the effects of daily oral iron supplementation on exercise performance in females of the reproductive age showed that it was not only maximal exercise 
that was positively impacted, but also submaximal exercise with improvement in heart rate and oxygen utilization. Iron deficiency can negatively affect immunity, can cause impairment in innate immunity, cell-mediated immunity, and interleukin production. In animal models, it has been shown that iron deficiency can affect the peripheral T cell count by causing decreased proliferation and delayed maturation, affect the T cell function, reduce interferon and interleukin production, and also affect the function of natural killer cells, thereby impairing impunity and also increasing the risk for infections in patients who are iron deficient. Iron deficiency anemia can cause cardiovascular compromise. This study looked at the six-minute walk test in iron deficient patients with chronic heart failure who were anemic or non-anemic, both at baseline, and then randomized them to receive IV iron supplementation with ferric carboxymaltose or placebo. And as shown in this graph, in the group that received ferric carboxymaltose, both the non-anemic but iron deficient and the anemic group, when compared to baseline, there was improvement in the distance covered during the six-minute walk test in the group that received ferric carboxymaltose, whereas in the placebo group, there was no, no significant difference. Also, studies have shown that iron deficiency can lead to increased hospitalization and incre increased cardiovascular mortality in these patients, and iron supplementation can reverse these effects. There have been infrequent reports of association of iron deficiency anemia and thrombosis. Though the cause and effect has not been fully elucidated, there have been several hypotheses proposed to explain the pathophysiology of thrombosis in iron deficiency anemia. We all know that in patients with iron deficiency anemia, the platelet count can be increased, and this reactive thrombocytosis can then lead to increased platelet addition and aggregation. Also, the microcytic red cells have decreased deformability, which can then increase the viscosity of the blood and cause a hypercoagulable state. In the setting of iron deficiency anemia, there is compensatory increased blood flow, which can cause turbulence and can damage the vascular endothelium, which can then attract more platelets and cause more plated aggregation and addition. And all these, in effect, can lead to thrombosis. Of course, in the setting of heavy menstrual bleeding, these females may be also taking estrogen-containing hormonal therapy, which can further increase the risk for thrombosis, which should be kept in mind. However, there have been several reports of females with heavy menstrual bleeding and severe iron deficiency anemia who were not on estrogen-containing therapy, who have had carotid artery thrombosis. Here is um, the carotid angiogram from three such women who had carotid artery thrombosis and stroke. Iron deficiency anemia has also been shown to be associated with significant cranial venous sinus thrombosis, as shown here in this MR image before and after therapy. Here's another 29-year-old female with severe iron deficiency anemia and significant sigmoid sinus thrombosis that led to venous hemorrhagic infarction. There have been such reports in adolescent females. In our own center, we've experienced adolescent females with severe iron deficiency anemia and heavy menstrual bleeding, developing cranial venous sinus thrombosis with quite serious consequences. Last but not the least, Iron deficiency anemia and heavy menstrual bleeding can cause healthcare utilization and drive up the costs. Why? Because severe anemia leads to hospitalization, transfusion requirements, hemodynamic stabilization needs, inpatient specialty consultation, and other medical and procedural management. Hospitalization rates range from 12 to 15 percent in reported studies. Dr. Powers and some of us looked at the Pediatric Health Information System Administrative Database looking at adolescents aged 8 to 18 years admitted with heavy menstrual bleeding and anemia from 2012 to 2015. And we showed that the median length of hospitalization was two days, but it ranged from one to 13 days. And ICU utilization was shown in 5%, subspecialty consultation in 20%, and red cell transfusion requirements were noted in 68% of this patient population. In our own center's experience, we showed that 
um, 24 percent of our patient population reported in general pediatric and adolescent gynecology in 2014. 24 percent had to be hospitalized and 80 percent required red cell transfusion. And these rates were similar in females with heavy menstrual bleeding with and without bleeding disorder. So to summarize, Iron deficiency anemia and iron deficiency are highly prevalent in females with heavy menstrual bleeding. It is important to screen these females with not only hemoglobin and blood count, but also with serum ferritin and other iron parameters to accurately diagnose and promptly treat iron deficiency anemia. Why? Because iron deficiency and anemia have been shown to be associated with depression, and to cause a negative impact on quality of life, academic, school, and exercise performance, to affect immunity and cardiovascular status, and also have rare associations with thrombosis and stroke, which can lead to deleterious consequences, and also can significantly increase healthcare utilization and costs. This concludes my part of the presentation. I will now hand over to Dr. Jacqueline Powers, who will discuss about the management of iron deficiency anemia. Thank you, Lakshmi. So for this portion of the talk, we'll focus on management. So the principles of IDA management serve for the outline for the majority of this section of the talk. We'll look at how you can confirm the diagnosis, briefly review the importance of identifying the underlying cause and correcting or managing the primary cause of the iron deficiency. And finally, the bulk of the talk will focus on how to provide iron therapy with oral iron therapy or parental IV iron therapy. And then finally, we'll talk about confirming therapy success. And in conclusion, I'll wrap up with some clinical trials that again, tie to the benefits of iron therapy and patient reported outcomes. So to confirm the diagnosis in patients in our patient population, you really need two components. The clinical history is important, so any risk factors for iron deficiency in young women and adult women with heavy menstrual bleeding, that in and of itself is a risk factor for iron deficiency. So if you take that history with a microcytic anemia on a complete blood count, you can make the clinical diagnosis of iron deficiency anemia in the vast majority of patients. Now, in patients in who the clinical history is not quite consistent with heavy menstrual bleeding, perhaps their menstrual blood loss has been better controlled, but they've had a persistent microcytic anemia, iron studies can be used for confirmation. Serum ferritin remains the best study to measure total body iron status. So even though it has some imperfections, that remains the best tool that we have. And it's important to remember that a low ferritin value is always diagnostic for iron deficiency. While there are many things that can cause that ferritin level to increase, nothing causes it to be low unless the patient is iron deficient. In complex patients who you believe likely has risk factors for iron deficiency anemia, but perhaps has chronic disease, either gastrointestinal disorders, such as an inflammatory bowel disease, or other systemic or chronic diseases such as rheumatologic conditions, it can be hard to differentiate and that ferritin value may be falsely elevated and put it within the quote unquote normal range. And in those patients, it is helpful to obtain a full iron panel and a transfer and saturation will generally be, generally be low in such patients. Another test that has been available for a few years but is generally a send out at most centers is the soluble or serum transferrin receptor one, STFR. That can be sent out and if you couple that with the ferritin measurement, you can um, calculate an index, which can help distinguish between iron deficiency anemia and anemia, which is solely due to chronic inflammation. This is a table of typical laboratory values that you'll see in patients with iron deficiency anemia. So we all know that a low hemoglobin and a low MCV equals a microcytic anemia, which is what we find in the majority of patients. The red cell distribution width or RDW is generally elevated in these patients, and that can help distinguish between patients with thalassemia trait, in which the RDW is generally normal. 
the reticulocyte hemoglobin equivalent, the RET, HE, or CHR, is low in patients with iron deficiency anemia. This is measuring the hemoglobin content in those newest baby red blood cells, the reticulocytes. So this will be low before iron deficiency results in full-blown anemia. It is also one of the first measures to correct. So if you start iron therapy, that measure should improve and normalize fairly quickly because again, those new red blood cells have enough iron to improve the hemoglobin content. The second half of the table looks at iron studies. So the serum ferritin again will be low and the classic definition of iron deficiency is typically a ferritin of under 15. Transfer and saturation, which is a calculated measure of the serum iron and the total iron binding capacity will be low. Like I mentioned before, the STFR can be used in some centers for more complex patients and this will be elevated in iron deficiency anemia. And then if you want to calculate the STFR ferritin index, that is high in iron deficiency anemia and will be low in patients whose anemia is due to chronic disease. Finally, hepcidin is the hormone that regulates iron homeostasis. There is one CLIA certified lab now in the United States that can run hepcidin measurements. However, because it is a very recently approved lab, many insurance carriers may not cover the cost of the test right now, and there's not a lot of data to suggest that it's more beneficial than, say, the ferritin or these other tests that are more commonly available. So identifying the cause of the iron deficiency and managing the cause is critical to ensure that the patient will fully recover. For this po patient population, we're talking about heavy menstrual bleeding, so I'm not going to spend time on how to control the blood loss. However, it is important that you do that and you follow up with your patients to ensure that they're adherent to that medication, particularly with patients who have recurrent iron deficiency anemia. We see this a lot in our adolescent patients who take OCPs for a period of time, but then for one reason or another decide to stop and then have recurrent breakthrough bleeding. So instead, we'll focus now on providing iron therapy, and I'll start with a review of oral iron therapy. So most of us are familiar with the pros and cons of oral iron therapy. It is cheap um, in general, and there are many available forms, including over-the-counter or by prescription. A lot of insurance carriers will cover the, the supplement for the patient. It is important to note, though, that all, all formulations are not equal. So there are the iron salts, such as ferrous gluconate and ferrous sulfate. These have the most data behind them and tend to be the best, most uh, effectively absorbed. There are other formulations that can be a little bit better tolerated and have better taste, such as iron polysaccharide or carbonyl iron. What I do recommend is if you recommend a patient go buy over-the-counter iron, that you write down specifically what you want them to take and the dose, including the amount of elemental iron, because it can be confusing. And sometimes patients simply pick up a multivitamin with iron, which is generally not sufficient to correct the iron deficiency. Oral iron therapy is effective in most patients who have classic iron deficiency anemia, but it has to be taken. Um, and if it is, it will work. The negative downside is that dosing is fairly unclear, although I hope to clear that up a little bit for you all with some recent data that informs how we can better dose oral iron therapy. Taste and side effects can be limitations. It requires three to six months of adherence. And in persons who have any concomitant inflammation, it has limited effect because the absorption um, just isn't possible. So we'll review now oral iron absorption and regulation um, within the duodenum and how it is regulated, which will provide some background on how we can best prescribe oral iron therapy. So in non-heme iron, so this is iron that's not found in meats that are found in other foods and in many of the iron supplements, iron is often in the plus three form. And this has to go reduction on the mucosal surface of the duodenum prior to being absorbed in crossing over DMT1. And within the enterocyte, it is then stored as ferritin. Um, if a person is iron deficient, that ferritin will then cross over via puriportin into the plasma and then is bound by transferrin where it's taken to the tissues to be incorporated into the new red blood cells or to other tissues who are low on iron. 
This whole process is regulated by hepcidin. This is the hepatic peptide hormone that regulates iron. Hep hepcidin works on ferroportin, so in states of elevated hepcidin, which can occur during inflammation, tissue injury, or in very rarely genetic conditions, Hepcidin is elevated, works on ferroportin, causes its degradation, and then limits ferritin absorption into the plasma. So you'll see here, inflammation, increased hepcidin, the blockage and degradation of ferroportin, that ferritin remains within the cell in the duodenum, and then when the mucosal lining is sloughed off, that ferritin is lost and it never enters into the plasma. So, a research group based in Switzerland wanted to investigate how we can measure hepcidin levels with different oral iron dosing regimens to best inform how we should dose oral iron in our affected patients. So this first study was published in Blood several years ago, and it looked at healthy women ages 18 to 45 years who were not anemic but were iron deficient, defined as a serum ferritin less than 20, and they evaluated absorption of various dosing strategies from low dose to high dose iron therapy via iron isotopes. So each different iron dose was um, radio labeled with a different label so they could distinguish how much of each dose of iron was actually absorbed. We'll walk through one figure before I go through the conclusions. So this figure is looking at patients who receive 60 milligrams of elemental iron. On figure A on the y-axis, you'll see the hepcidin level, and then on the x-axis is different time points. So on day one, this is a baseline measure of hepcidin. You can see that it's relatively low, and over the course of the day remains fairly stable. They recheck another hepcidin level on day two. This is immediately followed with the first dose of iron of 60 milligrams. What you can see is by 5 p.m. that day, hepcidin level spikes high. Remember, hepcidin blocks iron absorption. So at this point, hepcidin is high and any additional iron the patient is taking is gonna have limited absorption. By day three that morning, hepcidin level again lowers down, but it's not quite to the same baseline level as day one. The patients received a second dose of iron therapy. Again, they have a spike and then over 24 hours, the hepcidin level trends back down. Figure B shows the percentage of each of those doses of iron that were absorbed, and you can see that initial dose that was given has a much higher fractional absorption, so most of the, more of the iron in that dose was absorbed compared to the dose given the next day. And the researchers did this with different dosing strategies, so 60, 120, and up to 240 milligrams of iron. And their major conclusions from the study were that doses at 60 milligrams or higher increase hepcidin for up to 24 hours and lower the iron absorption the following day. So once you take that first dose of iron, your hepcidin is going to spike and it takes up to 24 hours to go back down. So they recommend to maximize the fractional absorption of iron. So to get the biggest bang for your buck, you want to give lower doses of iron somewhere between 40 to 80 milligrams, and avoid divided dosing or BID dosing. So we've all been taught that iron should be given in two or three times a day to maximize the absorption, but these studies and trending hepcidin have shown that actually that is not the case, and in fact, divided dosing will limit how much iron is, given, is absorbed in those subsequent doses. The researchers followed up that study with another study, again, in the same population of healthy women ages 18 to 45 who were iron deficient but not anemic, and they looked at daily dosing strategies versus every other day. So one group of women received 14 doses of iron in 14 days. Another group received 14 doses of iron but over 28 days. And what they found was that the alternate day or every other day group had 34% greater cumulative iron absorption. So they absorb more per dose than the group that received the iron every day. Now, an important caveat to this is that although the alternate day group absorbed more of the iron, it still was over a course of 28 days. So depending on how quickly you want your patient to get the iron in, how anemic they are, um, you wanna take that into consideration that daily dosing will still get iron into them more quickly, it just won't be um, as much per dose. 
A follow-up study, again, uh, reported in this manuscript was of split doses. So they looked at giving 60 milligrams in the morning, 60 milligrams at night versus just 120 milligrams once a day. And there was no benefit between splitting the doses. Again, thinking that in the past, we always divide the dosing to hope to get more iron in our patient, but in fact, that's not the case. So my personal practice is I always give once daily dosing um, and the, the total dose is really dependent on how anemic the patient is and how tolerant they are of it. But I only do once a day dosing. I think it's easier to be more adherent to that kind of regimen versus the divided dosing. So we'll move on now to IV iron therapy. Again, looking at pros and cons. IV iron therapy is effective for the vast majority of patients including those who have inflammatory disease. There are three formulations, which I'll discuss in a moment, that allow for full treatment via a single or total dose infusion. You'll see that in many IV iron patients, um, TDI. And that just means you can give in one dose all the iron that it's needed to get that hemoglobin back up to normal and to restore the iron within the storage sites in the body. Adverse effects are uncommon. Um, however, the downsides of IVR, of course, it is more expensive, and the newer formulations are more expensive than the older ones. And though rare, adverse effects can be severe, particularly hypersensitivity reactions, which mimic severe allergic or anaphylactic reactions, can be traumatic and result in the need for further intervention. There are five IV iron formulations that are available in the United States. The two left-hand columns, sparing gluconate and iron sucrose, have been around for about two decades. Low molecular weight iron dextrin has been around for a while as well. And then the two newest ones approved in the US are ferromoxetol and ferric carboxymaltose. They all have labeled indications for adults, and three of them are labeled in pediatrics. The primary difference that I want to highlight is the maximum dose that you can actually administer in one infusion. So you'll see that the older medications, your glucinate and iron sucrose, which have excellent safety profiles, um, well studied, used very commonly in patients with chronic kidney disease. However, you can only give 125 milligrams to up to 300 milligrams of those medications. So depending on how much iron your patient needs, this requires multiple infusions. The other drugs can be given in higher doses. Some of this is off-label, but um, lots of publications that support the practice. And I'll describe why, why there's such a difference between the label dosing. So many people think that IV iron formulations are all the same, but they're pretty different. And it's important to find out if you're interested or have patients that require IV iron therapy, learn what's on your formulary, talk to your pharmacist. Usually not all the IV iron formulations are available at all the centers. So learn what you have there and how to dose it and what can be approved by the patient's insurance. So the two principal distinguishing characteristics first lay in the strength of the carbohydrate shell that binds the iron. So all the IV iron formulations have iron core that's surrounded by a carbohydrate shell. And the strength of that shell determines how much iron can be delivered. The reason for this is that free iron released into the plasma can result in those hypersensitivity or pseudo allergy reactions and can be toxic. So you don't want free iron into the plasma. So the stronger that shell is that protects the iron when it's in the plasma and allows it to be um, phagocytose, um, the more dose you can give, the higher dose you can give of iron. The second is the immunogenic properties. So decades ago, there was um, the principal IV iron was high molecular weight iron dextran, which resulted in high rates of allergic reactions, and that limited the use of IV iron for many decades. Now there's much improved safety profiles, and the immunogenic properties are much less than before. However, you, you can have patients who have minor kind of urticarial reactions, either locally at the infusion site or diffusely, and the more severe anaphylactic reactions. Most of these reactions are actually hypersensitivity reactions or pseudoallergy. Risk factors are any previous reaction to IV iron, if you administer it at a fast infusion rate, patients who have 
severe atopic disease or multiple drug allergies are at risk, and certainly patients with uncontrolled systemic inflammatory diseases. As far as dosing of IV iron, there's two different approaches that you can take. The first is simply looking at the product labeling, particularly if you're treating adults. All of them have clear labeling for adults, so just two examples. In low molecular weight iron dextran, there's a chart that utilizes the patient's hemoglobin and weight and tells you the specific amount of the drug. For ferric carboxymaltose, this is weight-based dosing. It's a, a little bit easier. Dose at 15 mg per kg with a maximum of 750 per infusion. In Europe, it's approved for up to 1,000 mg per infusion. In alternate, if you want to be a little bit more precise, is you can um, utilize the Ganzoni formula and actually calculate the iron deficit yourself. So you can figure out how much iron precisely you want to give the patient. So the first half of the formula looks at correcting the hemoglobin. This is just correcting the anemia. How much iron do you need to get that hemoglobin up? And then the second half is just replacing the iron deficit. These are the iron storage sites. So you can calculate this, and then based on which formulation you're going to use, divide it up on the various infusions, and um, your patient should be sufficient. Looking at clinical trials, I'm just going to highlight a couple. This first one that was published in Transfusion in 2009 compared ferric carboxymaltose to ferrous sulfate in women with heavy uterine bleeding. The outcome was looking at the change in hemoglobin from baseline to six weeks. And although both groups showed improvement, a larger number, a larger percentage of women had um, a two to three gram improvement in hemoglobin at the six week time point compared to the ferrous sulfate group. Looking um, at a comparison of two different IV iron formulations, this was published um, in 2015, a trial comparing ferric carboxymaltose to iron sucrose for IVA and abnormal uterine bleeding. So remember, ferric carboxymaltose, this is one of the drugs that you can give a large dose infusion. And so this comparison was, again, looking at a short time period, I believe six weeks. And they found that the patients that received ferric carboxymaltose had a more rapid improvement in hemoglobin than iron sucrose. Again, iron sucrose requires multiple infusions. But the longer that you follow the patients out, those, those differences um, resolve. So again, depending on how quickly you want to correct the anemia can also inform which medication you use. Looking at adolescents with heavy menstrual bleeding, there has not been a lot of um, studies that focus solely on that population. These three cohort studies, all from UT Southwestern, uh, look at pediatric and adolescent patients who have failed oral iron therapy who were given IV iron. All three of these studies include adolescent girls who had heavy menstrual bleeding. So this includes a cohort of iron sucrose, um, a group receiving low molecular weight iron dextrin and amphoteric carboxymaltose with good response. There has been one pediatric publication from the U.S. on the use of ferromoxitol, but that was limited to adolescents with inflammatory bowel disease, although it did have um, good efficacy in that group as well. So finally, you want to confirm that you've successfully treated the patient, particularly in, this, in these um, girls and women who are at risk for recurrent iron deficiency anemia. And it can be difficult to determine what an appropriate response is initially. So I'm going to try to help clarify that. So as far as looking just at the anemia itself, at the hemoglobin, for patients who have mild iron deficiency anemia, that anemia should really resolve after one month of therapy. In patients who have a more moderate to severe anemia, you want to see at least a two gram improvement over the course of one month. All that being said, patients with both oral iron and IV iron therapy can have a much more rapid response, but this is what I would say is at least a sufficient enough response to know that they are taking the medicine, it is working, and you can continue with that line of therapy. For those patients who are taking oral iron, you want to give them a minimum of three months of iron therapy, and I highly recommend that you consider assessing a ferritin prior to stopping the iron. A lot of patients um, are happy when their CBC normalizes, but you really have to emphasize that, that ferritin will continue to go up and needs to be restored, 
otherwise one breakthrough bleed later they can drop and they don't have enough iron to to deal with that level of anemia again and they'll go right back to being symptomatic i also like to counsel patients on recurrent symptoms so as Lakshmi said, there are a lot of symptoms that are associated with iron deficiency, but they can be rather subtle. And so at diagnosis, many women and girls may not recognize how they're feeling. And it isn't until they're better that they then re realize how tired they were, how much the headaches were affecting them, the fact that they couldn't stop chewing ice. And so once you point those things out to them, you can tell them that if those symptoms start to come back, that they notice it or their loved ones or caregivers notice it, they should early be proactive and get checked much quickly, much more quickly rather than waiting for it to get become severe. So I'll just go over a few studies to wrap up on patient reported outcomes and iron therapy. One important study that looked at oral iron in young women um, looked at the cognitive effects. This was done over 20 years ago and published in The Lancet in 96. And this was done in over 700 non-anemic iron deficient adolescent girls in Baltimore. They were randomized to receive ferrosulfate or placebo for eight weeks and had a set of memory and learning tests. The group receiving the iron supplementation had improved verbal learning and memory on a subset of these tests. Looking at IV iron therapy, there's been a lot of benefits particularly with fatigue and some other symptoms such as restless legs. This is the same study that um, Dr. Shrivas highlighted, again, looking at IV iron versus placebo with a, a greater improvement in fatigue scores in those women whose ferritin was under 15. And another study, this was the preferred trial, again, looking at iron deficient women who received a single dose of ferric carboxymaltose versus a saline infusion, and there was a greater proportion who had reduced fatigue in the IV iron group. Within pediatrics, um, we have had one adolescent study, uh, a pilot study of 20 girls. This was published. This was done at Nationwide Children's Hospital. Um, the girls were 14 to 21 years of age. Again, normal hemoglobin, but were iron deficient. And they received a course of IV iron sucrose and had baseline scores done and then were reassessed at six weeks. And you'll see the ferritin improved from a low mean low of 13 to 141 over the six weeks, and their fatigue score significantly improved as well. So with that, I'd like to turn over um, back to the moderator, and she will go over how we can um, get credit for the course, and I believe we also have time to answer a few questions. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Powers and Dr. Shavat, for your presentations today. Um, the foundation is pleased to provide this webinar and continuing education credits at no cost to attendees. Um, you can help us to continue offering these types of programs by answering the post-test and evaluation questions to help us demonstrate our impact. The evaluation will be sent via email immediately following this program. Next slide, please. Um, at this time, we will proceed with the question and answer part of our program. As a reminder, uh, participants can submit their questions via the chat box in your GoToWebinar control panel. Um, and it looks like we already have a few questions um, that have come in. So we'll start with those. And the first question, um, it looks like uh, perhaps um, uh, Dr. Powers, you might like to address. Uh, we see a question, a question, excuse me, which CLI certified lab is running serum uh, hepcidin. So um, Intrinsic Life Sciences in California is uh, now approved to, to um, run hepcidin levels again. I would, I would caution that because it was just recently approved, many insurance carriers may not um, I would clear it before running that test, um, but that is the, the one center in the United States. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that. And um, let's do um, the next question um, for um, Dr. Shravas. In, uh, in, in patients referred to you for evaluation, 
of um, heavy menstrual ble uh, bleeding, excuse me, what is your approach to assessing for anemia and iron deficiency? Um, do you routinely obtain both the CBC and ferritin levels in all patients? Um, do you obtain iron studies only? Um, when the patient reports specific symptoms such as fatigue, uh, PICA, et cetera? Yes. Um, so as I showed earlier, um, in patients who come to us for heavy menstrual bleeding, um, I think it is important to evaluate them for the presence of anemia, but knowing that patients can have just iron deficiency without anemia, it is important to evaluate them for just iron deficiency in the absence of anemia. Um, so one could uh, look at two different approaches. Um, you may uh, obtain both a complete blood count and look at iron parameters simultaneously at the time of uh, diagnosis of heavy menstrual bleeding, or you may choose to rule out anemia and then um, to look at the presence of iron deficiency. For practical reasons in our practice, um, I typically obtain both a complete blood count as well as an iron panel at the time of diagnosis, so thereby, um, I will right away know whether the patient is uh, anemic and if the patient is not anemic, whether their iron parameters are normal or not. And this helps us to um, address the presence of iron deficiency and or anemia in a very timely manner. Okay. Thank, thank you for that. And we also received another um, question, Dr. Shravas, is what is your preferred IV iron treatment? Um, I think maybe Jackie can address uh, this question. Okay. Jackie? Sure. Um, so my, my per personal preference is for ferric carboxymaltose, actually. Um, the reasons for that are because I do like being able to give larger doses of IV iron. I think it's more convenient for the families. And you can give it in a relatively short period of time, so the infusion can run in as short as 15 minutes which limits the entire infusion visit essentially to maybe an hour if you're talking about post-monitoring. The other benefit is there's a lot of data on ferric carboxymaltose, particularly in adults with very good safety profiles. Some meta-analyses have showed that it has one of the lowest um, hypersensitivity reactions. And so even though it is newer and more, um, a little bit more expensive, I like it because of the convenience and the improved safety. All that being said, um, many of, again, you have to look at what's on your formulary, what's available, and what works for the patient. So iron sucrose is a well-studied medication. You just have to limit how much you can give per infusion. And if that's something that is covered fully by a, a patient's insurance carrier and they don't mind coming back for multiple infusions, then that's important to consider as well. So a lot of different factors. I can add to that. Um... In our own experience, uh, like Jackie mentioned, uh, we've had uh, different intravenous uh, formulations available in our drug formulary. And I think to some extent that is um, dictated uh, which medication we would administer. So early on, we've had IV ferric gluconate. Um, that is a shorter infusion, but like Jackie said, it, may, it has taken us um, two or three infusions to correct the iron deficiency anemia. And then we had the low molecular weight iron dextran. And of course, um, it, the formula uh, was a bit of a tedious calculation uh, to obtain the final dose. Um, and uh, so dosing errors are possible. And again, um, uh, it, it took us one or two infusions to correct the anemia. And then more recently, um, we have had the um, ferric carboxymaltose where the dose calculation is relatively easy. It is just weight-based, and it is typically taken just one infusion. I've had a child with a pretty significant low hemoglobin of around seven. A uh, child had, uh, I believe, inflammatory bowel disease, if my memory serves me right. And I was pleasantly surprised to see that his hemoglobin corrected to normal with just one infusion of ferric carboxymaltose. Thank you. Uh, thank you both for um, addressing that question. Um, we have received a couple of questions related to ferritin, um, uh, Dr. Powers. So we have a question about um, what is your target ferritin for therapy success? And then also, do you consider a low ferritin level when it is between 15 and 50? Um, some studies yes. suggest 50 as being low limit. Yes, that's a great question. So. 
Um, Figurative so level, there's a lot of debate on what is the threshold for what is a normal or low ferritin level. Classically, you will, across the board, a ferritin less than 15 for sure is iron deficient. Now, that being said, when I'm correcting anemia and I follow a ferritin level to stop therapy, I typically want the patient at least above 20. However, I will have a conversation with patients because some patients will feel fantastic at the ferritin of 15 to 20. They're not having any symptoms of fatigue rest his legs. There is data to suggest that a ferritin of up to 50, anything less than 50 in a patient with fatigue should be treated as iron deficiency. There's a lot of gray there. So in the paper that we reported on looking at IV iron therapy and women with fatigue, the improvement in fatigue scores was significant was greatest in the women whose ferritin was less than 15. When you got into the less than 50, the kind of 15 to 50 range, it was much more mixed. The results were less clear. So I base continuing iron therapy beyond ferritin of 20 based on the patient's symptoms. If they feel like they, they're still a little fatigued, we can certainly continue on and try to bump that ferritin up to 50. But as far as across the board calling everyone a low ferritin, less than 50, I wouldn't do that. I think everyone would agree a ferritin of 15 to 20 is a lower age and then a lower limit. And then after that, I would treat based on other, other iron deficient symptoms if present. Thank you. Um, I know we're a couple minutes um, after the hour. Maybe we'll take uh, do one more question. Um, Dr. Shravas, we have a question. Do you use changes in PBAC score as a measurement of decrease in heavy menstrual bleeding following iron therapy? Um, so yes, I think pictorial blood assessment chart score um, is uh, one measure that has been uh, used um, historically to uh, gauge the severity of heavy menstrual bleeding. And uh, we um, have utilized the score in uh, some of our uh, publications before and uh, routinely in clinical practice also. At the time of diagnosis, we document the uh, PBAC score, and uh, we uh, continue to use it as we follow the patient um, subsequent to therapy for heavy, heavy menstrual bleeding and uh, therapy for iron deficiency, and uh, that helps us to assess uh, whether there has been um, significant improvement in the control of heavy menstrual bleeding or not. Yes, we in our practice, we um, use PBAC score quite routinely, and we find that to be a useful measure. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, both for um, taking some of those questions today. That's all the time we have. Um, if we, um, as a reminder for those participants, you will be able to review this webinar for your reference or share today's proceedings with your colleagues by visiting the FWGBD website and accessing this webinar under the archived webinar section. Um, for those who may have questions on this material, um, that we didn't get to today or following today's program, we encourage you to visit our Ask the Experts feature on our website and submit your question online. Next slide. Before we go, we would like to invite you to join us on Friday, November 30th at our Friday Satellite Symposium on Evaluation and Treatment of Complement Mediated Diseases in Women of Childbearing Age, preceding the 60th ASH Annual Meeting and Exposition. Additional details and registration may be found on our website. Next slide. And we thank you all for your attendance and participation today, and we look forward to your future participation in foundation programs. Um, that concludes our webinar today. Thank you. <laughs>